When naming a compound that contains a transition metal, one of the most important things you need to remember is that transition metals have a variable charge. Because of that, we need to include the charge of the transition metal inside of the name. If you do have a transition metal all the way to the left in your molecular formula, you want to follow these rules to name it. And notice that these rules are almost exactly the same as the ones for regular metals. The only difference here is we need to include the charge on the transition metal. So it is the name of the transition metal plus the charge on the transition metal in Roman numerals, then the first syllable of the name of the negatively charged element, and then the ending I. How we determine the charge on the transition metal is by looking at the negatively charged species that it is attached to. And remember that many nonmetals, which typically have a negative charge, and all polyatomics have a specific charge. We will be looking at any nonmetals attached to the transition metal or any polyatomics attached to the transition metal to determine the charge on the transition metal. Remember there's a few exceptions. A small number of transition metals are named as metals because they have a set charge. These are zinc, silver, and scanadium. So even though these are in the section of the periodic table for transition metals, they're not named as transition metals. There is a small number of metals that are named as transition metals because they have a variable charge. So these are lead and tin. So even though they are in the area for metals, they are named as transition metals because they have a variable charge. When we look at the first one, NiCl2, the element to the left is a transition metal. And so one of the first things we want to do is determine the charge on the transition metal. So it has a variable charge, so we don't know what that is. And so we look at the negatively charged species to determine the charge on nickel. Chlorine always has a negative one charge. It is a main group element, so it has a defined charge. So each chlorine has got a minus one charge. So to make the overall compound neutral, that means nickel needs to be plus two the name of the transition metal, then the charge of the transition metal in Roman numerals, so our nickel was plus two, so we put the Roman numeral for two, then the first syllable of the negatively charged species, so this is chlorine or chlor, and then you add an eyed ending. The next one, Cr2O3, chromium is a transition metal, and we want to determine the charge on the transition metal. This can be a little tricky, especially when the subscripts are variable like this. What I like to do is realize that two of the charges of the chromium plus three of the charge on oxygen must equal to zero. So our compounds must equal to zero. There's no charge on it. We know what the charge is on oxygen. It's part of the main group. Oxygen is minus two. So overall, the negative charge inside of this compound is minus six. So we have two chromiums, and then we have a minus six charge due to all the oxygens. I then want to solve for the charge on chromium. So I add six to both sides. This says that two chromiums must equal plus six, or each chromium is plus three. Now that I know the charge on chromium, I can name the compound. It's the name of the transition metal, chromium plus the charge on the transition metal, which was plus three, so the Roman numeral for three. Then the first syllable of the negatively charged species, so this is oxygen, so it would be ox, and then the ending ide. So this would be chromium three oxide. Likewise, if a polyatomic is present, the ending does not change. And remember that polyatomics have a defined charge, and it's this defined charge is going to allow us to determine what the charge is on the transition metal. Here, FeSO4, the element to the left is a transition metal. I look at this and I can see the polyatomic SO42 minus, so I can see sulfate inside of here. I remember that sulfate has a negative two charge because they're present in a one to one ratio. I know that iron must have a plus two charge to counteract the negative two charge on sulfate to make this overall compound neutral. So the name is the name on the transition metal, which is iron, plus the charge on the transition metal, which is plus two, and then the name of the polyatomic, which is sulfate. So we do not change the ending on the name of the polyatomic. Here, CuCn, 
I have a transition metal all the way to the left. And then I identify that the polyatomic in there is Cn minus. The cyanide ion has a negative charge. Because it is negative, that means copper must have a plus one charge. The name of this would be copper one cyanide. The last one, the element to the left is gold, which is a transition metal. I then look to the negatively charged species to determine the charge on gold. I see nitrate as the negatively charged species inside of here. I realize that nitrate is NO3 minus, that every nitrate has a negative charge, but I have two nitrates. So the total negative charge must be minus two. That means that the charge on gold must be plus two in order for this compound to be neutral. I name it with the name of the transition metal, which is gold. I then write the charge of the transition metal in Roman numerals, which is two, and then the name of the polyatomic, which is nitrate.